Welcome back everybody to the Meeple Marathon. Today I'm going to be giving you my full and honest review of Sleeping Gods. Uh, this was one of my most anticipated games of 2020. It did get delayed a little bit um, for obvious reasons, um, but it finally started hitting people's tables here uh, about a month ago. Uh, I got my copy a couple weeks ago. I am about two thirds of the way through my first campaign, so I've definitely put in some hours with this game. Um, I've experienced a lot of the twists and turns of the story, so I feel like I'm at a good place to uh, give you guys um, a full review of the game. So, as always, I'm going to cover what I don't like about the game, what I have mixed feelings about the game, and what I love about the game. So let's get the bad stuff out of the way. And the first thing is that this game is a table hog. Um, you wouldn't think it because the atlas really isn't that big that's you know essentially your your map um <clears throat> and the individual hero boards character boards are not that big um and even when you first get it all set up it's still not quite that bad but then when you start putting your components around the outside you have to have some place to put your storybook you have some have to have some place to put your journey log um and then on top of it all because you know it's bad enough that you have to have all eight characters out and open and enough room to tuck cards underneath them and to be able to read those cards and tuck weapons underneath their corners. So you can't just mash them all up together. They have to be kind of spread out. Then you have all these adventure cards that you have to keep track of and you have to leave those available to be able to read and put command tokens on. And literally, I'm just like, I've got stuff spilling all over everywhere around here. Um, I'm, I'm making it work, and I guess technically if you were playing this with at least another person, a, a two-player game, they would have their portion of people in front of them, and you just kind of move Sophia, Odessa back and forth. I don't know how that would work, though, with all the stuff you can slot underneath her, but just in general, this is a table hog. Just, just be prepared for that if you are looking to get this game. You're gonna have to, you're gonna want to set it up, keep it set up for a while, um, because it's not super easy to save. But they do make a way for you to save it. Um, but it's, you know, you're having to pack away like health and figure out, you know, write down how much health was on people, things like that. And they really don't, like, you know, leave a spot for that in the save log. I'm gonna talk about that more here in a little bit. Um, the next thing that um, I really have not been a fan of, and this is more logistical rules-based, is the fact that there's different ways you use the command. The command is this you know, light blue um, tokens here. And for the most part, you use these to activate your adventure cards. You also use them to activate the um, special abilities of your characters. But there's also certain ability cards, and these are the smaller cards that you slot underneath people. Most of the time, they're just giving you an additional skill um, type to count towards skill checks. But some of them have um, actual abilities that you can use spend command on. But according to the rules, and again, I went back and reread it, and I, maybe, uh, maybe I'm just completely misunderstanding it, but you don't lock the command onto the ability cards. And so it's hard to really understand can I just keep reusing that ability card over and over again as long as I have command to spend? Because all the other ones, they're locked until you remove command. That's very straightforward. But I think it's more of the fact that the rules is not the same across all use of command. Um, the fact that it they, they changed it up a little bit. It's, just, it got, it's a little confusing. Uh, and the last thing kind of has to do with command, and that is that recipes cost command um, to use. And uh, I'm, I'm getting real nitpicky here, but let me find, here is soup. This is a starting recipe, so I'm not, you know, spoiling anything for anybody. You're going to get this right off the bat. Um, you, you know, recipes are the main way for you to heal up your characters and remove fatigue off your characters, also status effects. They are crucial to you being able to get through the game. So you're going to have to be using them somewhere. Around. But you're already having to give up materials you know in this one you have to give up three materials and it can be any of the food type of materials you give up three you place a command on it you get to make soup that's going to remove three fatigue and a low morale the giving up your materials makes sense obviously you gather meat you gather vegetables you gather grain and then eventually you pick a recipe to spend those on boom what i really am not a fan of is that it takes command to make a recipe 
all the other ones, all these other adventure cards that are slotted out here in front of me make perfect sense that you have to spend command on. There's a few that have passive abilities, but um, let me find one of my other starting equipment here. Here's the gear. Again, this is starting equipment. I'm not giving anything away. You have to pay a command in order to redraw a fake card. If you didn't, then you know, you would constantly be redrawing fake cards until you got whatever you wanted. So to use the gear, you're not having to spend anything else. This doesn't cost materials to use, just command. I don't understand why recipes, which, you know, materials in this game, food and general vegetables, meat, is not super scarce, but there are times where you don't have any and you need to heal up. And so you better find a port and pay to stay at the end because you don't have food to make recipes. So again, I'm getting kind of nitpicky here with my dislikes. The biggest one was the table hog thing, but I really don't understand why you have to pay command for your recipes. And I've got a lot of them here. Um, okay, so that really kind of takes care of the pure dislikes that I have for the game. I have a fair number of mixed feelings ones though. So let's go ahead and, and talk about those. Um, first off is the adventure cards themselves. I just showed you a couple uh, that includes your starting adventure cards, but you come across a lot of these throughout the game. Now, the reason I don't like them is because they are literally taking over the table here and I'm literally having to stack them on top of one another so I can just see the bottom. I don't get to see the artwork. If I were to try and spread these out, I would need a whole second table. It would be ridiculous. I mean, look at how many recipes I have. This is all the recipes. I keep these just in a stack. And when I'm like, hmm, I want to make a recipe. I need to heal up somebody. What do I want to make? Do I want to make soup? Do I want to make pancakes? Um, and I, I just go through my stack. They take up so much room because you accumulate a good number of them. But on the flip side, this is probably one of the more exciting parts of the game is getting these adventure cards, which help mitigate your skill checks, which give you you know, accuracy when you need it. It gives you blocks when you need it, you know, because your characters in general are not that souped up. You know, they have maybe one or two accuracy. Mac Johnson has four, which makes her guaranteed she's going to participate in every fight. But all the rest of them, it's like one or two, and your enemies have like five or six defense you need to overcome with your accuracy, however you want to call it. And so you need these cards, but having these cards and having a wide variety of them really helps the gameplay and makes you feel like, you know, you can survive fights and you can survive adventures and you can mitigate your skill checks. So yeah, it's, it's really like a love hate relationship with these adventure cards because I have so many of them now, two thirds of the way through the campaign, but I don't want to get rid of any of them. The only thing I'm willing to stack up and not have access in front of me at all times are my recipes because I know when I need to use a recipe and I just go flip through them and I lay it out and put a command token on. So, um, and while we're on the subject of cards, let's go to my next mixed feelings that I have, and that is the quest cards. Now, the quest cards uh, really just serve the purpose of giving you a keyword. And in the storybook, a lot of the um, paragraphs that you come across and the choices you make, you can only make certain choices if you have a certain keyword. Um, if you've come across that keyword and you know you, you have it written down is what most people used to do. And that's very common for storybook games. That way you can't get ahead or you know read a passage you're not supposed to. But for uh, the this particular game, instead of just giving you a spot on your journey log to write every keyword down and then cross through it, they give you these cards. Now, these cards are really nice because uh, I don't have to write it down. That way, if I forget, you know, or forget to cross through it, these are easier, I feel like, to grab and to have out and to not lose track of. They also have a little bit of flavor text. I'm holding this way back so you don't see what it is, but there's a little bit of flavor text on this side and there's a little wave symbol on this side. The wave symbol tells me that um, this is a kind of a quest that I need to go somewhere and use this keyword. And the little flavor text tells me kind of where I need to go. It's a little hint. So there's a lot more information on these cards than simply writing down the keyword. If there is not, 
a little wave symbol, that's usually the sign that it's a keyword that's going to keep you from going back and doing the same quest over and over and over again. If you defeat said minion at this location, it's going to give you a keyword that might say minion. And then when you go back to that story paragraph, it's going to say, if you have the keyword minion, skip to the end, because it's not going to let you fight and defeat the same minion over and over and over and over again. Um, so the keywords are integral. They are necessary. But that's part of the reason why I dislike the cards, because you can see I have quite a stack of quest cards. There's a lot of cards in this game. Similar to my adventure cards, I keep these stacked up. And every time I come across a paragraph in the storybook, and it's like, if you have keyword whatever, I'm sitting here going, mm, do I have it? Do I have it? Do I have it? Do I have it? No. And then literally two minutes later, I'm like, keyword what? Mm, I have completely forgotten all my keywords. Do I have it? Do I have it? Do I have it? Do I have it? No. So, and since a bunch of these I'm not going to be getting rid of because they're not quest keywords anymore, uh, I'm going to have this large stack of cards throughout the game. And I'm not sure whether these are going to carry over between one campaign to the next. Um, so, again... I don't like having to flip through all these cards, but I really like that it's more than just a keyword. There is extra information on these cards, which make it really handy to play the game. So, again, mixed feelings. Um, the next thing is very simple. This is a gripe I have with a lot of games, but unless you go that 110%, that extra mile to narrate your games, you're gonna have to deal with it, but that's the storybook. There's a lot of flipping through the storybook. The numbers are not close to each other. I'm looking at the map right now. I'm not going to show you because I'm not on that starting page, but 155, 149, 165, 120, 201, and 84. Those were actually pretty close together, but 84 and you know 201 are not even close to each other. So if I'm in that one location and I want to explore both those places, it's just a lot of flipping through the storybook, but it is what it is. It's a storybook game. If you are that opposed to flipping through the pages, then storybooks probably aren't your thing. But again, on the flip side, this is easily Ryan Lockett's best story in general, best narrative, best writing. I know he you know, doesn't write a good chunk of it. I, I know that he writes some of it and his wife writes some of it. And I believe there are a couple other people who did the writing for this game, but this is easily the best story in a game. Near and Far was, above and below was a little disjointed. Near and Far was good. This is excellent. Um, and so that storybook, I can easily deal with the flipping because the story is so good. Whereas a uh, previous game I reviewed recently, Ether Fields, I felt like was even more flipping. Same amount of like story points that you would try and use, but even then it was like, you know, flipping back and forth, um, you know, between it was like you start at 201 and it's like your choice is going to take you to 84 or 15. This one, it's at least it's like 201 and then it's like go to 201.2 or 201.3 as your choice. So there's not as much flipping once you're in a story. So I appreciate that. But this is by far Ryan Lockett's best story. So if that's what you're out for, keep listening. All right, um, the next one I'm only going to touch on briefly. I'm not going to spoil it, but if you have been watching my playthroughs, you will see it here eventually. Um, that's going to be your choice whether you're watching my playthroughs all the way. I'm not hiding anything, but those up front are obviously full of spoilers. But when you get to the event deck and there's like a specific story point that happens, at one third and then two thirds of the way through your story, let's just say something epic happens and something not cool happens. I'm just gonna leave it at that right there. And the last thing that I have mixed feelings about is leveling up your characters. Now, I think it's awesome that you can level up your characters because like I said before, none of them are really that impressive right off the bat. Not even the captain is that impressive. She's got a lot of stats, but some of these guys only have like two things that to their name, like, you know, Gregory Little here can only help you out in strength and savvy, which I guess makes sense. Um, you know, Captain Sophia does obviously has all of them. The skill checks are a big thing in this game. 
And so for the most part, getting those upgrades adds a skill level to their player board, essentially. Um, and so what I have done for a couple people here, and I'm not going to show them to you because I don't want to you know, spoil the, the upgrade cards, but Raphael here, he's essentially my strength man. He's my strong man. He's Mr. Muscles. I have kitted him out with as many strength cards, and some of those come from the ability deck while I'm playing, but when I have a strength test that I want to pass, he's my man. And that is a you know excellent strategy for the game. What I don't like about the XP cards is that some of them just don't make any sense at all. Like, um, you know, I just showed you Greg Little. He's got strength and savvy as his two starting icons, and he may have an XP card in here that gives him cunning. Well, that's just then giving him his first level. Why am I going to purchase that XP card when there's obviously somebody else I have kitted out with cunning and is my cunning person for skill checks? You know, I don't understand why they went so, you know, off the rails with some of these symbols that they're not even symbols that you can then double up on. Nobody has two symbols to begin with um, to, to pass skill checks. So you're going to have to add a skill card, an upgrade card, an XP card to their character in order to even give them two starting skill and then add ability cards to give them more in order to help pass skill checks easily. So why are you gonna even make me pay XP to upgrade a character with just their very first skill check? I hope that makes sense. It's hard to show you without showing you the actual, you know, upgrade cards, but here's just, here's an example of an ability card that's got the strength symbol on it. So if I were to put this on say Audrey right now, um, you know, if this was her XP card, this would be giving her her very first strength symbol. Well, I am probably have not been using Audrey for strength skill tests at all, obviously, and I'm probably not going to use her now with just a single one. So, you know, what's the point? Anyways, um, all right, so that was the last of my mixed feelings. Let's get into what I really love about the game. Flat out... This is the best Ryan Lockett game I've ever played. This is the best storybook game I've ever played. This is the best exploration adventure game I have ever played. Uh, narrative driven game I've ever played. This has amazing artwork and an excellent story, a sense of adventure to it. The closest thing that I can compare this to is when I was playing, uh, you have to be into video games to understand this, but Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild the openness of that game, the fact that I literally could go anywhere and sometimes was going back and forth across the map to, to take things out and I could have stopped at any point and you know, tried to take on Ganon. That's how this makes me feel. It I get that same feeling playing this game that I did playing Zelda Breath of the Wild. Just the, the sheer awe of it and wanting to do everything, but knowing I don't have time to do everything or I don't have the health to do everything. And sometimes maybe I'll go back because I passed something by. I remember climbing up to the tops of those towers in Zelda and just looking around and being like, ooh, I wanna go there, I wanna go there, I wanna go there, and I wanna go there. I get that same sense of exploration and satisfaction from this game. There is so much here. I have, I'm two thirds of the way through my first campaign and there, I'm not even close. I don't even think I've looked at half the pages in this book and I haven't even found content that's part of the Tides of Ruin expansion, which I included, which is there, but I haven't even found those areas yet. And I know that I'm only basically 18 rounds away from finishing this campaign. I, I'm already thinking about where am I going to go when I start a new campaign. You kind of start in the middle of the map. Here I'll show you kind of what this map looks like. And you start right here. And so you can go down a ways and right and left or up a ways. And, you know, I've really just kind of stuck in this area right here and done so much and felt like I have gotten so much out of this game. And I've only hit on like five of the sections. It is just so well done. It is different. The combat is different. The use of the characters is different. Um, you know, that the spiral bound Atlas is not different, but the fact that it's a sailboat is different for him. Uh, it's not you moving your person around points. It's like park into an area. And then what can you do all in this area before you want to steam on? Um, this is just easily Ryan Lockett's best game.
by far. I, I, I can say that with, you know, true conviction. And if you are a fan of his games, this is a no-brainer purchase. Um, I'm going to dial it back down just a little bit now um, and cover more specific things. One of the things that I do really like about this storybook, and I didn't kind of cover it in my mixed feelings about the storybook, because this is truly a singular point that I really appreciate that the designers did with this game. And that is when you go to a city, especially if it's a large location and there are multiple choices you can make, almost every time when you make it to the end of a little decision tree, it circles you back to that very, it doesn't say return to the ship. It says go back to the market or wherever you started your little questioning of people and, and doing little events. So with one exploration action, because you only get two actions per turn, you can do everything there is to do in that city, port, wherever it is. That's not always the case because sometimes the, the story has to stop you after a certain action and that's okay. But for the most part, I'm not having to mill through all of my turns and action allocation just to explore all there is at, you know, this one port. And I really appreciate that. Other games that I have played, it's like you want to do anything, you gotta, you better pick the right one. There's five choices, but if you pick one, you make it all the way through to the end, and there may very well be it's a dead end in the story, which I don't like to begin with, but I can understand not everything can lead to something. But when I get to a dead end and then I have to spend another action, I have to spend another resource just to circle back around and pick B instead of A at the very beginning of the decision tree, it drives me crazy. But this one, you can essentially say, all right, I'm exploring this location and that one action lets you do everything you probably will want to do in that one location. And that just, I know it's something very small, but it is a big deal for me. All right. Um, the next thing is, and I know I kind of already covered these, but I really wanted to talk about adventure cards again, because these things are what I look for to level up. These are what I want in my hand, more so than the XP cards, more so than the ability cards. These are cheaper to activate than the ability cards are to slot. These are cheaper than XP is to spend on the upgrade cards. These adventure cards are what make the adventuring awesome. Otherwise, this game would be way too tough. But the choices, man, that I have to make when I go to the market and I'm purchasing adventure cards is like, I want to buy it all because I want all this stuff in front of me. But money is tight, so what do I really need? I'm going to buy this one. Or when I get an adventure card for free, that's probably the best. I would rather get a free adventure card than XP. More money in this game we'll just put it that way adventure cards really make this game go and even though they take up so much room on the table i love having them in front of me and what really make the game tick um another thing that i really appreciate and this is very simple but if all of your crew you can play on brutal and that means if everybody dies or your ship takes full damage you're done but normal mode, not easy mode, normal mode. If everybody dies, you simply make it to port and you lick your wounds and you're not done. And I really appreciate that because I'm not here to prove that I made every decision correctly and made every strategic combat decision correctly. I'm just here to enjoy the experience. And I don't wanna be penalized for making a wrong turn and ending up in combat that I couldn't handle, which happens most often. I will say this, this game is not easy. Resources are tight. Combat is tough. I have yet to come across a combat that I just breeze through. It just does I don't think it exists. Ryan Lockett gives you this level based on what the combat, you know, all of the people have their own number, which you search for, but then each combat scenario is given a level, right? And I don't know what it goes up to. I've seen as high as 17, I think. So it must go up to 20, probably. I have yet to see a single digit combat level. All of my combats have been in the teens. I think 11 has been the easiest combat that I've done. Somewhere out there, there's got to be a one. I just haven't come across it yet. So let me preface this. This game is not easy. So being able to regenerate on normal mode is nice i'll just put it that way 
All right, the last thing that I want to talk about, um, and I'll stop gushing on this game, is this journey log. Now, this side of the journey log, meh, you, a, a huge section of the game is there for when you save the game. And this is only if you're putting it away a lot. Um, and then there's a way to track XP and how many times you flipped over the event card. Brutal mode, you know, def normal mode, defeats, things like that. How many times have you been defeated, blah, blah, blah. But this side, though, I'm going to hold it way back. I mean, if you're that hellbent on reading my secrets, that's fine. But I love this little map. I love taking notes on this map. I love writing down keywords, circling things, scribbling all over it. I love that I have probably 30 more over here to do 30 more campaigns. I love this map. I love the aspect of this that I can see everything there is to see. I can see what the world looks like from God's view, essentially. And I can already note something way over here, even if I discovered it way up here. I don't have to have discovered all this and then take a note. I love this map. I love incorporating it in my game. I love taking notes on it. I know that some people say, why would you ever take notes on it? Well, I, I don't see the point. That's fine. You don't have to, it's not required. But I think it is the coolest accessory for a game that I've ever come by, at least an adventure game. I love it. So that, ladies and gentlemen, is my full and honest review of Sleeping Gods. Like I said, if you are a fan of Ryan Lockett games, find this game. Buy it when it hits retail. If you are a fan of storybook or exploration adventure games, buy this game. This is it for you. If you don't like games that have... a uh, it, it's not even fiddly. It's really not fiddly. There's not that, but there's just a lot of stuff going on right here. Um, you know, there are eight, nine people you have to control if you're playing solo, but you know, it's not like you have to make a decision for each one of them every single turn. Um, so it feels like there's a lot going on, but it is, is very streamlined. It's just a table hog. Honestly, um, I can't see any reason why if you are a serious gamer, um, and you're looking for a good cooperative game or a good solo game or a good adventure narrative, good story game, something a little different, I don't know why you wouldn't check this game out. So, um, I honestly found it very hard to come up with things I disliked about the game, and those were very nitpicky. Um, and I'm just going to say it right now, this is so far my best game of 2021. Now, it's very early but if I had gotten this in 2020, this would have been my top game of 2020. This would have beaten out Marvel Champions because I don't want to stop playing this game. I am powering through my first campaign because I just want to keep sitting down and keep going, keep going, keep going. And I'm already thinking about playing another campaign because I know there is so much of this game I am not going to get to explore in, through the first campaign. And there's just so much out there. And I want... To to, to go track it down. So uh, if you enjoyed this video, please consider giving it a thumbs up. Um, if you end up purchasing Sleeping Gods because of my review, please let me know in the comment section. And if you'd like to be part of more videos like this in the future, please consider subscribing to the channel. Once again, thanks for watching. Have a great day.